Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Can everybody hear volume-wise? I usually try to stay away from the mic because I'm so damn loud. Um, I'm so excited to do this panel tonight. When Pam first talked, Pam Jaffe from Avon first talked to me about putting this together, I love these authors. Like, this is such a fantastic lineup of authors, and I'm really humbled to be sitting down here. I promise not to mansplain anything. <laughs> I'm super conscious always of being a dude in a woman's industry, and I have so much respect and, and deep gratitude for the women who have gone before and built the industry, because I do feel like I stand on the shoulders of giantesses. So um, tonight, tonight what I really wanted to talk about, we're t the title is Romance com dot 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 ellipsis, it's complicated. And I was reminded of this quote um, about sentimentality. I was, I was having an argument with a sort of literary friend who said, the problem with romance is it's so sentimental. It's always kind of leading you down a path and then giving you what you expect. And I said, well, then it's obvious you're a moron and you've never read a romance novel because no, no great romance is actually sentimental. And so then I started thinking about, well, what is sentimentality? And the best definition I could find is that sentimentality is the belief that there is a single interpretation for anything. So that if you only think something is pretty, you only think something is evil, you only think something is good or safe or warm or wet or horny or whatever, you have devolved into sentiment because you're erasing all of the complexity and irony and tension in whatever situation, person, entity, genre, etc. What I think is fascinating about this group of women is that each of them wrestles with sentimentality and complicates what could be sentimental at every turn and in different ways. And so the questions I'm gonna be asking are sort of along those lines. I'm gonna to try to leave room for questions at the end. You look like a very voluble, chatty, opinionated bunch, and so I wanna leave time for questions. Um, before we get started, I was thinking we would go down and have everyone talk about the next book they have coming out, um, just to let us know what we can expect and when we can expect it. Yes, there. Hi, I'm Marie, and um, <laughs> I have um, the next book that I have coming out is Outrageous, which is book seven in my quantum series. I'm Julia, and um, this book comes out next week, but I think they have it here tonight. And then the last book of this series, uh, Seduced by Scott, comes out in November. I'm Laquette. Uh, the next book I have coming out is in January with Dream Spinner Press. Uh, right now, the working title is Prey, but that is subject to change. <laughs> I'm Sarah McLean, and my book, Wicked in the Wallflower, is out today. Um, and the next one is called Brazen and the Beast, and it is out next year, because I'm really <laughs> slow. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and the next book I have is the first book of my uh, young adult fantasy a duology, um, The Blood of Stars, and it is out next year with Knopf. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Um, to start with, I want to throw McLean right into it, because I feel like that's <laughs> always the way to go. Oh, uh, oh, something's happening. There is, in fact, why, thank you. There is a hashtag. That would be hashtag hard so romance. <laughs> because romance is best when it's hard. <laughs> hard romance, boys and girls. Um, so to begin with, Sarah, I have a question for you, all right? I was once at a Galentine's Day event sitting next to you. We were discussing different words for vagine. And as we were discussing it, Sarah said something really interesting. We were talking, it was a lot of historical authors, there were several historical authors, Georgian, Regency. I'm couple terrified. Couple. <laughs> and she turned to, there were two of us that actually all, I write contemporary mostly, I've written a little historical, but she turned and she said, you contemporary people, I don't know how you keep things interesting because everything is so straightforward. Like, you're both hot, you both have jobs, get married, what's the problem? <laughs> and so I wanted to start off with talking to you about the issue of complication because it sounds like you use the, your subgenre as a source of complication. Do you think that is true? Yes, I think I cheat. I write romance, I write historicals, and for me, writing historicals is cheating because there are so many things that you can throw in the character's way that force them together into, you know, writing romance novel is always sort of watching, it's kind of like making ballet happen in a telephone booth, right? Like we have these rigid um, walls around us and we sort of have to work within those rules, but it feels to me like contempor great contemporary authors, like, 
the ones here, um, spend a lot of time figuring out ways to make that ballet feel as though it's in a telephone booth despite the fact that the walls are much broader, right? If you hate, if you go on a date with somebody and they're terrible, you never have to see them again, right? Because we live in the world and, and you just don't, right? You have telephones, you can tell people that you don't like them or do like them, you can resolve misunderstandings instantly. I get to say, well, that misunderstanding is in Scotland, so it's gonna take two weeks to figure it out. <laughs> so yeah, I am a cheater. Do you think you could ever write a contemporary? Challenge. <laughs> I, maybe, but I need to write a lot faster. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I, I think that my, I read a ton of contemporary. I mean, I, I read a book a day, so I read a lot of romance novels in general, but um, I read a ton of contemporary, and I feel like I learn so much every time I read a great contemporary romance because I think we spend way too much time as a culture and as a, as a society saying contemporary romance is easy. Um, and in my opinion, it, I'm often blown away by how hard it must be. On that tip, I'd like to transfer the next question to Marie Force, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> because she is known for taking what could be quite simple situations and braiding them and weaving them into a wild tapestry. What I would like to know from you is, do you think that contemporary has evolved significantly since Treading Water? Oh, Treading Water was the first book I wrote in 2004 and five. Um, yes and no. Um, it's being done in a lot of different ways these days that are very cool and very different. And um, for me, it has not changed tremendously because my core story is about family and community and the themes that go along with that. And so um, by staying close to that core story, whether it's a family that you choose or a family you are born into. Um, I have series that have you know, multiple siblings. I have series that are business partners who kind of come from sketchy backgrounds and so they have become a family. So in that sense, um, my core story hasn't changed, but the genre around me certainly has and has become much more dynamic and diverse, which is awesome. Um, there's something for everyone in romance these days. Um, on that tip, Laquette, you and I were talking earlier. Um, my husband is a forensic investigator, and there's a thing in a crime scene called a void pattern. A void pattern is when a weapon is removed, but there's the outline and gore of where the weapon was. So I was talking to Laquette about what she thought the potential void pattern in contemporary romance was. So like, as romance is changing, as readers are changing, what is the thing that you think is missing from romance today? Um, well, what I have always felt was missing from romance were people that look and lived like me, <laughs> so that's why I wrote, <laughs> because I wanted to see people that looked and lived like me. Um, it was great reading books that <clears throat> had all of these magical places, and but no one talked about places like Brooklyn, which is where I'm from. So I wanted to write a book that talked about the loveliness that I believed <laughs> existed in Brooklyn. So I feel like that's part of what's missing. Um, diversity, making sure that everyone is represented on the page. That's what I feel is missing most from romance today. Across the board in all subgenres. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I, especially uh, historical. Especially historical. It's, it's, there are very few, um, very few authors of color that are well known and historical, and um, it it just shouldn't be. Everyone should be able to tell their story and see themselves on the page. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? Does there anybody have anything to add to that? No. Um, Elizabeth, if I can ask you, um, do you uh, so your first your first released book is with Disney, and so you were working with a corporation and exist a story that was very familiar. Did you feel that you had to? What was the impact on the, on the storytelling, I guess is the way you should ask. I was actually really excited because I got the go-ahead to um, make the, to flesh out the romance between Mulan and Shang. And so I was like, yes, you know? So that, that was very exciting to me. <laughs> it was actually just, I have to tell you, if you've not seen this cover, it's the most gorgeous cover I've ever seen in my life. I deep cover envy. But I was so relieved that the romance was kind of allowed to blossom because the way it was framed, the way it was framed, I didn't know how romantic it would be allowed to get. But you are a romance reader. 
Yeah, I grew up, my mom has a garage full of romance books, and I would just pick them and go through and just like read them. And I think it actually helped a ton with my writing, um, especially even in YA for like tension and yeah. Can I also just add that the, the tagline of this book, I'm staring at it and it's amazing. It says, what if Mulan had to travel to the underworld? And like, all I want to do is leave you guys here. And I like, go read this book. I have to tell you, it is that good. You totally want to. Um, Julia, Julia, this is the moment. So I'm gonna quote, I'm quoting from Tempted by the Laird, which is on sale right over at that desk. The quote is from, it's not a spoiler, but there's this great quote that says, how refreshing that Hamlin did not tell her what she ought to do or think as her brother or father would have done, as the men who wanted her land would have done. What do you think is the relationship between romance and autonomy, agency for women? Oh my God, just give me like the most loaded question, right? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> okay, so to be fair, that's a historical romance. And I think that um, the evolution of historical romance recently has been women taking um, more control of their lives than we have seen in the past. You know, when I first started writing historical romance 21 years ago, um, the heroines were cute, they were innocent, and they really didn't know how to get along in the world, which I still kind of like. But I, I think the evolution has been to something like this, that they're beginning to realize that um, they can take control of their lives, they can make a difference in their lives, even if they didn't have any rights, even if they couldn't own property, even if they could be bartered away in marriage. They were figuring out ways to do it, and I think that's been one of the biggest changes in historical romance. And do you see it in other subgenres? Um, I do. I don't, I mean, I don't read as much contemporary romance as I do historical romance, but I think it's the same there, too. Was that the question? That was the joke? question, okay. exactly. <laughs> Again, anybody else have anything they want to add to that or throw in on that? No, you're all very warm and, and, and sullen. Um, okay, well on that tip, um, I am currently obsessed with a book by Lynn Hunt called Inventing Human Rights, which argues that the modern democracy grew directly out of modern literacy, that when you teach people to read and empathize with an othered protagonist, little by little people start to think, gosh, maybe women have thoughts. Gosh, maybe people of color are not animals. And so over time, Lynn Hunt has really persuasive, persuasive evidence linking the rise of literacy and the rise of popular fiction with the rise of democracy and the rise of the belief in human rights, the falling away of torture and tyranny. It's a great book, I really recommend it. But having said that, what do you each think, I'm gonna make you all do this, what do you each think that you do to move the needle and save the world in your books. <laughs> Get busy. No, start down there. <laughs> you jump around. Jump around. I, I would just say that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about saving the world in my books. I think about entertaining people who are sitting at the bedsides of sick relatives and women whose um, romance life hasn't necessarily gone the way that they hoped it would. Um, I got an email today from a woman who, after a long fertility struggle, gave birth to a beautiful baby girl who was born with a genetic disorder that's gonna end her life in under a year. And she told me that when it gets to be too much for her, she goes to Gansett Island. Um, and to me, if that's all I ever do to change the world, I can live with that. But isn't that saving the world? I mean, isn't that, that's, I, I mean, am I wrong? Isn't that what? I just mean it's not like social issues and things like that, you know? I mean, listen, having a child that you love is a social issue. I think that's it. I don't know, for me, I feel like um, whenever I write a book, whenever I sit down and write a book, I strive to make sure that people see humanity in my characters, especially because my characters are, um, I write multicultural characters, but usually my heroines are African American. And um, I, it's always, uh, it's very important to me that when people read these books, that they're not looking to see a black heroine, but they're seeing that this is a woman who has the same sorts of issues and, and troubles and tribulations that any other woman of any other nationality or ethnicity 
would, or racial background would have. So for me, I'm, it's always very important for my characters to be very human, but it's also very important for my ladies to be divas. They have to be independent. They have to be able to take care of themselves. They want a man in their lives because they want a man in their lives, not because they absolutely need to have a man in their lives. And so that's what I do. <laughs> I would say, um, for me, the challenge is to make the characters as relatable as possible. It's that whole concept of, you know, you're not alone, you're not the only one that thinks this way, you're not the only one that feels this way, and capturing that in a character is what I try and do. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when we're talking about literacy informing civil rights, we're talking about civil rights as a, an, an individual rights and humanity as being um, some kind of thing that we have to strive for, which of course we do. We're, I mean, we live in the world, everybody sees the news, we do have to strive for that every day. Um, but I also think that when, whenever we're talking about that, we're, we're talking about subversion, right? Because in order to find ourselves, to, to claim a piece of the civil rights pie or claim a piece of the, um, the, the equality pie for ourselves, we have to subvert um, something that exists already, call it patriarchy, call it you know whatever you like. Um, and I think that when we sit down and we write romance novels, when the genre, when anyone in the genre writes a romance novel, there is a single rule, which we all know, um, because we've all been enraged by the end of romance <laughs> books that call themselves romances, which is the happily ever after. And happiness is a subversion. Right? It's a subversive act. When we take, when we claim our happily ever after for ourselves, we are claiming our future, we're claiming our equality, we're claiming our space in the world, and these things, these things are, are important and they're powerful and they're subversive. It makes other people angry when we are happy. Um, so be happy. Make everyone mad. <laughs> That's how I'm feeling today. So I tend to write fantasy with a touch of history. And uh, I've noticed that the common thread in my books is that I love writing about, about strong girls who are put in positions where they're told they can't do something. And I love being able to write, write a way for them to be able to do it and to just show that like, they're strong and, and uh, they don't need a guy to, to be able to help them do it. They can do it on their own and the guy can fall in love with them because he's just like, wow, you're so awesome. <laughs> that actually reminds me, um, when I was, Julie, when I was reading your new book, um, I was thinking how much all of your books are a riff on privilege or a riff on like what it means to have privilege, what it means to occupy a position of power, to exchange power, with, and that, not, not just in literal sort of financial terms or political terms, but sexual terms and social terms. I felt like so much, I mean, of all of your books, do, do you, is that something you do consciously or is that just something that sort of comes out in you wrestling with this autonomy thing? Um, I don't know if I do it consciously, but um, the, the concept of privilege is on my mind a lot and it has been very recently. I mean, for the last couple of years, I think about it quite a lot and I think about, um, I don't know how to say this, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound, I don't know how to make it sound. I think about the kind of privilege that white men have um, and don't know that they have and what they've had for so long, you know, and that has, and especially in a historical novel where they had it all. I mean, you know, they were the, they got to rule the world basically and they still do. And that kind of surprises me that we're still at a place where white men rule the world. And so, yeah, I guess it is, I don't, it's not like I'm trying to bring it into my romance and make it all about no, it's privilege. it's not nonfiction. You're just yeah, you're but it, I story. mean, but it is in, it is in my brain a lot. Yeah. Is that true for everybody? I mean, do y'all do y'all think about like who's in charge and who's not in charge? Um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Uh, when I am writing a book, my as Sarah said, you know, you're subverting. My my idea is to subvert normative culture, and for me. Um, as a, a woman, I've, as an African American woman, I've always been told, you know, certain things about my life, you know, that were supposedly predetermined, and so all of my heroines are in some way um, touching on those predetermined pieces of nonsense that people have told me about myself over the years, and those. Are, this is my opportunity to show the world that mm, no, there's no little box that 
you can put people in, they are who they are and they are who they become on their own merits. And that, so that's very much a part of my thinking when I'm shaping a character. Right. In my books, most of the women are large and in charge. <laughs> and the men are like just trying to get out of their way. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's obvious exceptions, but um, I mean, even in my quantum series where there's a dominant and submission um, element to them, I mean, it's very clear that who's in charge. Um, and it's always the subs who are um, so far all women. And um, in the last book, it's going to be a man, which will be fun to write, really fun to write. Um, but the women definitely. Um, it, my fatal series, um, Sam Holland is, is, you know, a homicide detective who literally writes her own rules as she goes, gets herself into a lot of trouble doing it, but is always, her heart is always in the right place. And I think, you know, men tend to get out of her way, which really is always fun to write. So, um, you know, I think there's definite exceptions in all, you know, in all series and books and what, regardless of who writes them, there's always going to be women who are a little bit more docile in some the way they come off on the page, but yet they have backbone and they are not afraid to speak up for themselves and they're not afraid to go after what they want, which I think is really an important message to send to people who are reading that, who maybe are not in situations at home where they are able to make their own decisions and to you know chart their own course. So I think that's an important message that we can send, especially I think that's something in contemporary romance in particular, um, that we kind of have to be cognizant of the fact that we're setting an example for people who maybe don't have that agency in their own lives. It's funny, actually, um, it, look, what you, in Wicked Wager, you do a thing, we were, at, at the end of the book, I mean, obviously, HEA, I, like Sarah, I am hardcore about that HEA, but I also think that HEA is kind of like pantyhose, it's been pulled over so many legs, it doesn't hold its shape anymore. <laughs> so we, we have different types of HEA, and I think sometimes different authors approach a different kind of HEA. But in Wicked Wager, your HEA isn't just the fact that they have like smoke and bang times. It's not just that they have like deep and abiding affection, but there's also this sort of entrepreneurial spirit. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, as I said, most of the females that I write are usually, um, they, they have careers, they're educated. Um, they've had established lives before they ever meet the hero. And so, especially in Wicked Wager, this is a woman who is a PhD in chemistry. She is a cosmet, she's a, a, a chemist for, and has her own cosmetology company. Um, she's doing big things and is attempting to do bigger things uh, when this man kind of stumbles along in her life. Um, it, the whole book is basically about them fighting over some formula that she has created. And he wants to purchase it, and she's like, no. But the, <laughs> the, the fact that she is so invested in her own company, like the, the struggle is constantly, that this is, this is a, a legacy for me. This is something that my mother handed down for me, to me. And maybe one day I might want to hand this down to children of my own. I can't so easily give this up just because one, he wants, he's cute, and two, because he wants to give me a lot of money. I have to really think about this. So I, I, and I think women of today make those sorts of choices. We have to make those sorts of decisions about what's important to us, because everything is not just monetary. Money is nice. But there are, you know, money doesn't make you happy. And, and my women usually realize that. They have their own, they can do their own thing, but they're not about their dollar. You know? But they pay a price for but that. But they, they do I mean, pay a price. Elizabeth, for that. you do that too. Is there's a price to be paid for that satisfying ending? Do you, do you want to jump in on that? Like, obviously, she takes a very intense journey yeah. to get where she's going. I think a lot of the book of reflection is also about Mulan's journey to discover herself as well as to rescue Shang from the underworld. And the price that she pays actually becomes part of her reward in the book because um, by going through this terrible journey to save the captain, she, she learns more about herself and like what she's able to sacrifice um, for her friends and for her family. Which makes the happy ending that much more satisfying, right? right. Like when you get to it, she's earned every moment. She's mm -hmm. earned every, I think that's so critical in romance too. Like it's very easy for two underwear models with trust funds to like have <laughs> orgasms every time they brush their hair. But I mean, no, like what's sexy about that? If it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't, there's no, uh, there's nothing else. All right, so, all right, so before, I, I don't want to run on too long. 
There's a thing that happens when spiders make a web. So when spiders make a web, they spin a little bit of silk out of their little spinnerets, and they allow it to drift on wind across a chasm until it sticks to something, and they feel the vibration, and then they tug it taut, and then they run up their own thread that just came out of them, and then they do it again, and again, and again, and that's how they build a thread. I actually think that's how genre happens. I think that each of us sends out a little web, and then we figure out what works and what doesn't, and then we run along the little thread. <laughs> what do you all think? the future of romance is moving towards. What are the complications currently pointing down the line toward in the future? Does anybody have a sense? Does anybody want to make a weird Kreskin prediction? I will. I'll just jump right out there. I mean, I think we are definitely moving towards um, inclusion. I mean, I think that's very obvious from the, um, some of the books that have come out and done well and, and some of the authors who have stood up for themselves. And, and like she said, you know, we don't, even see, we don't see it a lot in like historical romance, but you're seeing it a lot in contemporary romance, and I think that's going to happen. I also think we're going to see um, stronger women, women standing up for themselves. And, I, I, you know, women have always stood up for themselves in romance novels, but I think that the, the voice is what's we're going to see a change in. Women are going to have a stronger voice than they've had before, just because we're all having to have a stronger voice in our lives. I think um, we are getting to the point where we're kind of hitting this wall um, where diversity is concerned, where it's no longer just something that can be talked about. I think, um, I think publishers are starting to notice that re readership they want more. They want more than what they've seen. They want an inclusive world because that's the kind of world that they live in. And so they need to see that in their books. So I'm, I'm optimistic that at some point we're, we're walking toward being more inclusive and everybody being able to see themselves on the page. Speaking for YA, I think we're moving towards seeing more stories that don't revolve around in insta-love, um, like fewer, for instance, I think Twilight um, really made like, once she saw the vampire Edward, she was like madly in love. I think we're starting to see that fade. And I think more of the characters in YA are exper experiencing failure, failure, and they're not falling in love with the first guy that they meet. And they're learning more about themselves in the process and becoming richer, deeper characters. I think we're starting to see romance come in from the outside, too. Um, I mean, I love that. The fact that. You know, those of us who've been reading romance for our whole lives are, you know, far too long they should have been reading romance like myself. Like, romance was, was, a, was never on the inside of the circle, right? It was never considered to be a legitimate place to be working or writing. Um, in my, I've said this before, and some of you probably heard it, but in my childhood library, romance was literally kept in the back corner and they had the lights off in that section, like, <laughs> which made it awesome. <laughs> but, um, but I feel like um, we're, what we're seeing now is, and, and I've, I feel like I've been screaming about this for years, and I apologize to all of you, but romance has always been, because it's the genre that's largely written by women, it's always been the genre that centers women and centers the female gaze. And as we're starting to see the world kind of pay, sit up and pay notice to the female gaze and to the state of women in the world, I think many, many people are starting, starting to like turn their gaze to the genre and say, well, wait, what are all those ladies doing? And, um, and I think that's really powerful. And I think what it's doing is establishing us as um, a kind of literature that is constantly iterating on the society that we're writing in, um, largely because all these people write very quickly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so like when something happens today, tomorrow, there's a book that's having conversation, a dialogue with that. And we're, we don't see that as much in literary fiction. Um, and we don't see that as much in thrillers. Um, but we see it all the time in romance because this is where women are. And women are keenly aware of the world that we live in um, and, and how it impacts us. And in the us. media, too. I mean, I'm seeing this a lot in television and film, et cetera. And you've talked about this, about the way that publishing has sort of shifted over the last 12 years, right? The, I mean, don't you think that this is a indicative of something larger? 
Well, I think it's become more open to a lot of different voices that in the past would not have had an opportunity, like such as mine. Um, a lot of my books would not have been published if I had not published them on my own. And um, my most successful series was rejected um, by every publisher in romance. But, you know, in the end, that turned out to be a good thing for me because um, I was able to publish it on my own and do a lot of things with it, even in, within the books that I would not have been able to do um, probably within the confines of publishers who have certain ex expectations, you know, and which is fine and totally within, you know, the purview of what they're looking to do with their lines. Um, but I was going to say, as far as the predictions are concerned, um, I'm seeing a lot more men reading my books than ever before, and I'm seeing it more and more and more. Um, I have friends here tonight, reader friends from Long Island, and um, one of their husbands is reading Quantum and loving it, and he's got a picture of himself with his Marie Force fangirl mug, and he's he's. <laughs> really proud <laughs> and I get emails from men I get um, and not not um, well I get those too but <laughs> in fact when I got my first pick I really I said to myself I've really arrived now all I need is a letter from prison I'm not gonna say that's my daughter back there and she knows what kind of picture it was <laughs> I sent it to her <laughs> But I said, well, I've arrived, and uh, she said, I just said, I just need a letter from a prisoner and, uh, to make my life complete. But, um, you know, I've also learned not to make predictions about the romance genre because it continues to surprise me with the directions that it goes in, and especially with all the indie voices out there that are doing anything and everything, um, it's just really an exciting time to be in romance because you never know what's going to happen next. What will fall away? I'm not a prediction. What do you wish would fall away in the genre right now? I mean, there's such a huge glut right now. There's a gazillion books. There's, a, there's crazy upheaval at Amazon obviously going on. We've just had Cocky Gate. I'm sure people are aware of Cocky Gate, right? So obviously the understanding of what IP, of intellectual property is, of what a story is. Um, I, I spoke really briefly with Elizabeth about this at the beginning that we were talking about sort of working in transmedia. When you work for a multimedia conglomerate, what does that do to the books that you write, the stories that you tell? When you're writing serial instead of novel or novella instead of short, what does that do to the kind of readers that you communicate with? Do you, what is the thing that you think will go away? What is the thing that people come? I'm not throwing to you, I'm just throwing it at the table. I mean, I have one. I'd like to see Nazis go away. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yes, please. I mean, I'd like to see Nazis go away. I'd like to see uh, SS. I'd like to see Stasi heroes go away. I'd like to see, I'd like to see, yeah, I'd like to see all of them go away. I'm tired of seeing them. I'm tired of having to say no more Nazis. That seems legit. <laughs> I think one of the things like, you know, with the influx of indie authors and a lot of new voices coming, I think a lot of authors, and I, I have an uh, author group that has about 7,500 members in it, so I hear a lot of talk and whatnot, but I, I think a lot of people are finding that it's really, um, it's, it's not, a, it's a big deal to write one book, absolutely. It's a bigger deal to write, you know, 30 or 40 books, and I think a lot of people are realizing that they may not have more than five or 10 books in them, and that it makes it so that that gets to be a more difficult career path. And people are quitting jobs, and they're going all in, and then they're realizing, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be <laughs> to continue to produce at the level that I need to in order to support myself. And I think, you know, it, it, yes, there's um, a lot of opportunities out there, and there's a lot of um, things that we can do now that we couldn't do even 10 years ago. When I was first published, um, there was only one way in, and now there's multiple ways in, which is great, but it also has put tremendous pressure on a lot of authors to keep up with you know, whatever they see their favorite author doing or whatever they think you have to do to be successful, and I think it takes some of the joy out of the writing for them. Um, and I always tell them, if you're not doing this because you love to write, then you're definitely in the wrong business because I've set my whole life up, so that's pretty much all I do is write, and that's all I really want to do. It's you know, and so if if that's not what you really want to do, then I mean, it's going to become really hard to make a career out of this. And I think a lot of people are realizing that the the further they go into um, the business, that there's a cold reality of holy crap, I got to write a lot of books, you know, and like holy crap, I don't think I have a lot of books in me, <laughs> you know. So um, I think some people are are finding it to be difficult for that reason because it looks like so much fun but in the reality it's a lot of days with no shower you forget to eat you smell something and you realize it's you and you know <laughs> I mean it's like there's nothing pretty about it you know? <laughs> so I feel so seen yeah. <laughs> 
Sometimes I think it's the dogs, and then I'm like, no, it's yeah. me. Well, I want to go on record and say I have never forgotten to eat, ever, <laughs> not once. That always, but well, you, I really, look at me, I haven't either. <laughs> You know, one of the, what personally I wish would go away, it was what I call the Netflixing of genre fiction. And, you know, once Netflix started putting out series where you could, you could binge on it, then readers started wanting the same thing. And the pressure to produce and keep things out on the market is so great. And I wish people just personally would just like slow down and let a few months pass. <laughs> but I mean, that's what it's become. I mean, we, we, books are getting shorter. The cadence of books is getting shorter. Everybody wants the whole series as soon as they can get it. It's also actually changing. I mean, I, I don't know how aware everyone is. It's affecting the way the, the traditional publishers, the way the big five are handling mass market paperback right now. Literally acquisitions are changing. The way they handle romance is changing because of the influx of this, what they call churn fiction, where people are just, you know, pumping, 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 or working under a ghost, like working with the ghostwriters under a single pen name where they'll have 20 or 30 people working on a single pen name. So yes, it's having a dramatic and hideous, I yes, it's intense, it. intense. Um, now, before I lose the thread, um, Elizabeth, uh, you are a musician and a composer, um, and uh, it's really you should go check out. It is Liz Liz Lim. What's the composer site? Oh, composer site is Liz Lim. I, I tracked her down. She I stalked did. her. <laughs> so I was because you when I when you're moderating, you want to stalk people naturally. Um, she recommended this book, which actually I'm now reading and loving, um, by Haruki Murakami. It's called Absolutely on Music: Conversations with Seiji Ozawa. I want to quote something, and then I want to ask you why you found it resonant. All right, and the quote quote is, no one ever taught me how to write, and I've never made a study of writing techniques. So how did I learn to write? From listening to music. And what's the most important thing in writing? It's rhythm. No one's going to read what you write unless it's got rhythm. The combination of words, the combination of the sentences, the paragraphs, the pairings of hard and soft, light and heavy, balance and imbalance, the punctuation, the combination of different tones. As in music, you need a good ear to do it. How do you know when your ear is good when you were writing? It's a really tough question. Um, I, let me circle back a little bit. I, I think music has always played a really large role in, in my life and in my writing because I grew up actually wanting to become a composer. I had no idea that I wanted to be a writer, mainly because I didn't think I would ever be good enough to write a book. Um, and I was like, there's so many books out there. Um, anyone can write. So I think I'll do music because it's a little bit it's a little, the competition is a little bit less fierce. At least this is what I thought in my eight-year-old brain. And then, <laughs> um, but, but since I, I really love writing both music and, and fiction, and um, because I guess my background is more in music, I've always felt like I really need to teach myself the craft of writing. And so every time I write a book, I try to read it out loud and try to listen for the rhythm of my sentences and my phrases and to see if, if things get boring, if things if the phrasing starts to to just grate on my ear. And I think that's really helped with, with every aspect of my writing. But I think, but I mean, it, I mean, doesn't everyone have some degree of music? That's what fascinated me about the quote, is it resonated so deeply with me. Mm -hmm. Even if you are not musically inclined, I think we all yeah, have a sense of- Yeah, I definitely of, think so. Um, because there's, it, there's so much, it's, a paragraph is so much more interesting if you vary the sentences and you just build intention and everything. I think it's something that all writers innately have. Well, maybe not innately, but we will work towards it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we use words like voice, right? When, yes. when editors or agents say, oh, I want some of the voice, I want some of the voice. This is a very tricky thing to define, and many people are loath to define it for that reason, because it's, it's, uh, it's ineffable and evanescent and constantly evolving. Not an, not an easy thing. Do you all, if I say to you, like, what is your voice, do you all feel like you know what your voice is? Like, you know when you've written a sentence and you're like, that is a Sarah sentence. I would know that I wrote that anywhere. I don't know that I know it, but I feel like the, like, she knows it. That's my editor. <laughs> and she says, I'm going to call you out on something because you, she says all the time. that So she edits you know, many, many people um, who are all amazing. And she says all the time that if she read one paragraph written by any one of us sh without any other information, she would know exactly who wrote it. Um, and she also, for those of you who are, who are looking for editors, she also says like, that's how she looks for an author. Like she's looking for that kind of solid voice. Um, but if you ask me, all I would say is like, well, I really like 
you know, short sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I use italics way more than I should. That's like all I know. Me too. It might be a Rhode I Island thing. I feel so seen. <laughs> it's a Rhode Island thing, Sarah. <laughs> Probably. I know one thing I do when, um, when I start to get into a hole or I start to think like, oh, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'll just say to myself, just do what you do. Do what you do. It works for them. You know what I mean? Meaning my readers, they like what you do. So do what you do. You know, and so sometimes like it's as simple as getting out of your own way and, you know, just letting it happen and not being all caught up in, you know, is every word perfect? Because trust me, it's not. And, you know, just like I just wrote my first historical and um, it's coming out for Kensington. Well, I didn't just write it. I started writing it in 2010 and I finished it. I sold it in 2017, finished it in 2018 and it's coming out in 19. It's my longest book evolution ever. Um, so I noticed too, like the copy edit was a lot heavier on the historical than anything I've ever had before because I'm doing something totally different because it's not what I do, you know? So I saw the difference between what I do and what I do and doing what I don't do and how I needed all these, you know, much more help with the historical. So um, sometimes I think it's just a matter of recognizing your thing that the readers look for in whatever you're doing and to give it to them every time. Whenever you read a Le Quet book, you know it. Uh, my voice is very distinctive. Um, I, I, I'm a strange mix of like literary fiction mixed with Brooklyn, mixed with a soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's kind of what happens in all of my books. <laughs> that's, I think that's perfect description. Well, I know this much. I know when I'm writing, I know when it's not my voice. And I don't know if I could say, oh yeah, that's definitely my voice, but I definitely know when it's not. And sometimes, usually the first part of a book, it takes so many iterations to get the tone right and the voice right that it's like already in me, but sometimes I just can't find it. And that's what takes so long. And once I have it, I can pretty much go through it. What is the scariest thing as an author? What scares you the most and what would be, make you willing to do it? Each of you. Right. Well, release day what is, is no fun. What is the scariest thing for you as an author? What's the thing that you cannot stand doing? I mean, there's a complication, right? I'm trying to throw a complication out. So what is the scariest thing for you as a creative professional, and what would it take to force you to do it? Money. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it? What's the thing? What's the thing? How much? <laughs> let's, say, let's say blank check. What is the thing that you absolutely don't want to write, or you hate writing? What is the thing that would, would make you do it? Paranormal, and no amount of money could make me write it. Ever? <laughs> Ever. Why? I, I can't read it. I, I just, I, I think I have a very weird suspension of disbelief issue. Um, I just can't go there. Yeah. No, I mean, and it, I've so never. They can be like preternaturally hot, but they can't. I, have nope, powers, I, nope. So. I don't even care if they're hot. I no, like I'm saying like <laughs> contemporary. They can all have like perfect bodies. Do the yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I don't know, but like I just can't. I've never successfully read a paranormal romance, not once ever. So I know I couldn't write it, and I, I don't know that I could do inspirational either. And I'd be very scared of that because I would get in a lot of trouble for how I would do it. There'd be way too many JCs in there, <laughs> and you know I'd get into a lot of trouble. I'm going to say erotica. I, in fact, I think. Oh, come on. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, it's just, your, stuff, your stuff is so sexy, really? Well, yeah, but, well, maybe, well, I don't read erotica, so maybe I just think I know what it is, but I. But there's a big difference between that and erotic romance, because erotica is like the real dirty stuff. It's just sex, sex, sex. Yeah, but erotic just, romance, there's an it. actual story, so. I'm too old or something. I just, like, I have no patience <laughs> for it. I can't, I, I just couldn't do that. There's not enough money for that. But there's enough money for everything else. <laughs> I love writing erotic romance. Sorry, um, sorry. I'll show you. Sweet romances. I, I, um, I have actually been challenged by some friends of mine. Um, sweet and historical romances. Those are the two, two genres that I just kind of shy away from. Um, and I have been challenged by several members of my cohort to write <laughs> a, a sweet romance. And people don't believe I'll do it because you know, my stuff is kind of filthy and intentionally so. Um, but one of these days I may, you know, if, if Hallmark really wants me to do it, <laughs> I'll, write them, I'll write them a sweet romance. Um, I don't know about, I don't think there's a genre that I would necessarily shy, shy away from. Um, 
I, but I do think that for me, I, th I think for me it's probably a trope. Um, I've never written Friends to Lovers. And <laughs> I know. And it terrifies me because as we've already, as you've probably guessed from all the things that I've said, like I really like bananas plots with like lots of conflict and maybe they're gonna kill each other literally. And like, and then yes, yes, like soap opera is my jam. And so the, and so for me, like the idea of two people who have loved each other their whole life and also now have just like randomly discovered that they want a bone is um that's my fave yeah like i i know but i like i appreciate when it's done like okay tessa dare does this better than anyone writing um lauren blakely does this really well i just read this incredible book by um naima simone where it's like an unrequited friends to lovers so there is a little like conflict in there but she's he it's hot. You should all go read that. It's called Scoring Off the Field. Um, but the, so I, I can appreciate it, and I, like, and I can read it, but I just can't imagine writing two people who like each other. <laughs> <laughs> but there's sure enough money for it. Yeah. I mean, like, so, if like, my editor was like, I'll give you millions for it, yes, of course, the I'll readers soldier love through. It. The readers love it. Damon has Bless written them. that book. I, yeah, I, I write that book over and over again. Um, Elizabeth, do you, have, do you have one? I don't think there's a genre I would shy away from either at this point, but something that I would be really loath to do is to kill off either the heroine or the hero. Um, I think we would be loath for that to happen. We, we would have a problem with that, I believe. I have a friend who tried to convince me when the two characters died at the end that they were happily ever after in heaven. And I'm like, oh no, 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 we will not have that. Um, all right, before I steal all the time asking my questions, why don't we ask some of your questions? I'm gonna pass the mic, and the beautiful Kaylin is going to walk about and hand it to you. Raise hands, I'll hand it to you. Who is your favorite author, other than yourself and not on the panel, that you just really enjoy reading and can't wait for the, the next book to come out? Did everybody hear that question? Who is your favorite Avril author? Avril Ashton. If uh, gay romance is your jam, pick up a book by Avril Ashton. You will not regret it. Um, Lisa Kleypas is mine. Sarah Morton. I, I'm a deep Sarah Morton fan. And like her books have cartoon covers, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh my god, kill me. They're gonna like brush their hair. <laughs> I only tried her playing so hard, the stewardess thought I was, I was sick. <laughs> I really can't think of a, a favorite author. I just read so widely. And I was trying to think, because there's authors that I've read several of, but I can't think of who they are. <laughs> this is, oh god. Um, well, uh, certainly Lisa is, is one, is Lisa Kleypas is one of them, but I can't, I can't just do one, so I'm gonna do a couple. So Charlotte Stein. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I mean, sure, but that wasn't what I was going to say. But. Um, I think if you've never read Charlotte, she writes um, deliciously hot, um, kind of short, um, really, really beautiful contemporaries. And the thing that I say about it, I think she's one of the best romance novels, romance writers writing right now, top five for sure. Um, one of the things that she does remarkably is it's like you're on a crowded subway car and you've gotten on and you're like standing like this and they're right here in front of you just falling in love madly and you can't, you're like, oh God, I shouldn't, oh, please. And then there's like, they're doing it and you're like, I can't, I, I'm too close, but I can't not be here with you. And it's so unbelievably wonderful. I've never seen, she takes on so many risks. She wrote a book called Never Sweeter where the hero, it bullied the heroine in high school and now they're in college together and they're together, they're in class together and she's terrified of him. And like they fall in love and <laughs> when I started I was like, no way is she gonna be able to pull this off. Charlotte has never taken a challenge that she hasn't. 
succeeded do in crazy getting. Expect, like insane creative challenges. Yeah, so, I mean, she's remarkable. Charlotte Stein. She does write for Avon, doesn't she? She did write for, she's written a few books for Avon. She's self-published. She's, she's written and sort of all you around. And then my other person is Alexis Hall, who um, writes queer romance um, and is just another person who just writes like stunningly beautiful prose. His voice is so strong. I feel like it's, he must be a musician. When you were talking, I was like, oh, I wonder who was a musician. Like this is one of those, those people who the, the prose is just so lyrical and the characters are so beautifully developed. If you've never read For Real, you really should. I think it's his like capstone book. It's remarkable. I, I could go on. Come see me later. I actually carry a card with me that you can all have that has like recommendations of books I love. I have a page on my website with 200 books I love, all with readers, who, books, you know, and writers that I love. It's actually really hard for me to pick a favorite book, a favorite author off the top of my head as well, but I'll share with you one um, book and author that I just finished reading, and that's Sweet Black Waves by Christina Perez. It's a YA historical with a romance at the core, um, The Legend of Tristan and Isolde. And it is so romantic, and it ends on such a delicious cliffhanger. I, I think you would all really enjoy it. <laughs> um, I have a question in the it's complicated vein. So I love historicals. Those are my favorite. But one thing that always kind of trips me up is um, it's not even a trope because it's historically accurate, but that the heroines are always so sexually inexperienced. And um, that that's just something that continually it just comes again and again. And there is a power dynamic there. And um, with how romance is tied into fantasy, I just wonder like what some of you who've written historicals, what you think about that. And sometimes authors get around it by making widows, but a lot of the times they had shitty sex with their first husband. And, and so it's not even like they have this sort of sexual autonomy. And, um, I think contemporary does that so well, and that's just something I always want to see more of in historical, but I realize it's hard. I, in this series, this Highland Grooms, I told my editor at the time, I said, I cannot write another virginal heroine or I will slip my wrist. I just can't do it. <laughs> and I mean, I'm personally so far removed from that, you know, I just can't even, so I, Definitely made all the women either widows or have had a sexual ex uh, experience before. And then in the last couple of books, I thought, why am I doing that? I mean, why can't they just have their first sexual experience and not, you know, not make a big deal about it? You know, like they just, they have sex. But I'm with you on that. I mean, it's, it, gets, it gets a little old, I think, that they're so innocent. Because women are, you know, this, have been the same for centuries and they, come on, we were not... None of us were that innocent the first time we had sex, right? So, yeah, I'm with you. I don't write historicals, but I just read literally, like a couple of days ago, um, Joanna Shoup's uh, Magnate in the Knickerbocker Club. And I will tell you one of the reasons I don't usually read historical is because of that fact of the virginal heroine. But even though this heroine is virginal, she is given, she takes a lot of autonomy. Not that she's given it, she takes a lot of autonomy, much to, um, much to her own detriment. Like her, her social standing suffers because of the fact that she takes a lot of autonomy. But that's one of the things that the hero loves about her. And, and that's how she kind of makes it work. And I thought it was brilliant, I loved it. Um, Magnate by Joanna Shoup, and it's a, I think it's a three or four book series. The Knickerbocker Club. It's three yeah. and a novella. Yeah. And the novella is called Tycoon, and it's Strangers on a Train, it's so hot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's and it's like 99 cents, you should, oh, it's so good. Joanna. So good. She like ends up in the private train car of the president of the Bank of Manhattan, as you do. <laughs> it's delightful, it's delightful. One of the things I like about reading historical, though, is, is that difference between the way contemporary women are much more sexually um, adventurous and advanced um, and that the mores of the time that, that a lot of these women lived in had them under strict lock and key. Their parents, and they were chaperoned, and, and the expectations were that they 
you know, behaved in a certain way. And um, I sort of, I like that difference. Like when I read historical and um, I actually, the, my one, my single historical, which is supposedly there's gonna be two as of <laughs> later this year. And I've got to write the second one in like three months and not nine years. Um, so that's gonna be an interesting challenge. But um, one of the things about the first one that I really enjoyed is that while she is sexually innocent, she's very set in what she will and will not put up with. And um, I think that there were other ways that they managed to show backbone um, at a time when they couldn't necessarily be as promiscuous as they would have liked to have been, or even more adventuresome, um, not even to be promiscuous, but adventuresome. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I actually enjoy reading about historical, is that they have to find other ways to show their power. And, um, and I, I, I enjoyed writing that. Time for about two more questions, unless there's any other responses. Great. So when you are confronted with the statement that romance is really simplistic and really anybody could write it at any time, once you come down from scratching the walls with rage, what author and book would you recommend as a refutation of that statement and why? Just forget about books, um, but just romance in general between human beings. It's not easy. Um, I mean, if that were the case, we'd all fall in love instantly and you know marry immediately and have 2.5 kids or what have you. That's not really how life works. <laughs> yeah, like it, that's not really how life works. Um, and so, if when you are experiencing it, it's not easy. So to try to orchestrate it as a writer, it's, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of thought about how to make these two people come together in ways that are actually believable on the page. Things that are not gonna make you roll your eyes, because I read some things that make me roll my eyes, and I'm like, dude, this would never happen. I'd just walk away. Like, I would never give him the time of day. And you don't want your reader to do that. So I think anyone who is making statements, you know, really general, generalized, generalized statements like that is because they've never actually picked up a romance, a good romance, anyway. I always ask them when the last time that was that they actually read one. Like um, people love to say that kind of stuff, and you know, they love. There's a lot of things that people like to say to you, especially when you write romance under your real name. And I write r erotic romance under my real name, and thus my children's real name. <laughs> that, that's really fun for them. <laughs> um, but you know, there's a lot of crazy stuff people will say, and like you know, you, you just have to like tell them like it's not like it's not what you think it is and um, I think if you took the time to like actually read one you might find that um, your perception of it is outdated read any of them and you'll find that your perception is outdated yeah. WC Fields once said it's not what they call you it's what you answer to mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you have to reject the premise of the question, obviously, first of all. But um, I think that also the, the struggle with romance is because it's so broad. I mean, when you say, like, what's the one book? I mean, I could give you, yeah, I mean, I could tell you that I think Sierra Simone's Priest is like a remarkable meditation on erotic romance and also inspirational and God and faith, right? Like I think what she's done in that book is virtually impossible and it's magnificent. I could tell you that Cat Sebastian's un Unmasking the Marquis is like a tremendous, treme it's Marxist, it's a, it's a Marxist treaty set in Regency England um, about a non-binary person and the Marquis that she falls in love with. Um, I mean, like, there are incredible books out there, um, and I could list many, many for you, but I think that the issue is always about, it's something about the genre itself being perceived as cheap because it's for women, and it's about the genre itself being perceived as simple because it's about something that every single human being has either experienced or witnessed and it sells like it is used constantly in society as a 
a signpost for our humanity. And so we all think we like, we richly understand it. And most of us do richly understand it, but no one would ever tell me that their love story or their parents' love story or the love story of their best friend or their love story of, you know, whatever is simple and, and cheap, right? So we're really talking about a problem possibly with sex and probably with gender. And when they make sex jokes, like they'll like they love, you know, like especially my friends' husbands, you know, they love to get me going. And I'll just be like, you know, you two are the result of a sex act, and that usually ends the conversation like right there, you know, because nobody wants to think about where they came from, you know. But there's a lot of really stupid things people say to you, and they know that what you do for a living. And then there's also, of course, very lovely things that people say, but the stupid things tend to stand out a little bit more than the lovely things. Got time for one last question here. Hi, um, I have a question uh, kind of for everyone, but it's to do with historical romance and just kind of the level of importance you place on research and then how married you stay to historical accuracy and kind of where you draw the line as to where your characters can just go. Well, um, so I... For reasons that escape me now, I minored in British history. I have no idea what that was all about. <laughs> but so I, you know, I studied a lot of British history, and then through the years, I have collected a lot of research materials on the Regency era and sort of the early Victorian and the later Georgian. So I've just read so much of it that I've kind of become a little mini expert in it. And so, if I have a question, I know exactly where to go in the books that I have. Um, I would say that for the research, but I have, you know, I always paint the historical like this. You know, the story is about the love story between two people, and the history is like the room that they're in. And it's, it provides the framework. You want it to be accurate, you want it to have windows and doors, and you want it the, the furniture to be period pieces, but the focus of the story is the two people in that room. So it doesn't, it's not such a big deal for my books because most of it's about the love story. I was the same way writing my first one is that I focused on the romance and I brought in all the details that I could from the time period that to try to make it authentic. And um, mine is actually Edwardian and it's turn of the century, um, Duchess by Deception. Um, and it's, I tried to like be true to that time period and to figure out like what was going on in that time, that year that I set it in and like what um, historical things were happening around them, what inventions, it was a time of great, um, advancement, um, and it was really fun to write in an era that I don't see a lot of um, in historical romance. It tends to be more of the Regency and the Victorian, but so it was kind of fun to do something a little bit different. Um, but I tried, like I know I probably didn't get every single aspect of it correct, but I gave it a hell of an effort. Um, one of the challenges with writing historicals and with coming to the table with historicals for readers, especially readers who've never come to read historicals is that readers are often afraid that if they come at a historical they're going to find it to be really boring or really you know dense or really full of history and i think um that they would be very surprised many readers are very surprised when they discover that what was true then is often still true now and the the research often art just sort of imitates life and and nothing really historic there are of course like things that weren't historically accurate or um items that didn't exist but the the world hasn't changed very much so in answer to your question like my characters always bathe they bathe daily like <laughs> my heroes like are very clean my heroes you know they all brush their teeth like that's not real right i write in the 1830s this book is set in covent garden which was not as posh as it is now they definitely probably wouldn't have bathed, but right there in the first chapter, my heroes have brought running water to this place, right? <laughs> so there's that, but I also, and if you'll humor me, I'd like to tell a, a story, um, which if you follow me on Twitter, maybe you read today, so I apologize for repeating myself. But um, the, when I was doing the research, for, I go to London twice a year, I tell my husband it's for research. <laughs> and um, while I was there, I visited the Foundling Museum, um, which if you ever get to London, I highly recommend you go to. Um, the Foundling Hospital was 
founded in the 1730s, and uh, it was for basically babies that couldn't be kept by their parents because they didn't have mu they they were unable to be kept. Um, so they are, either they were true orphans, or they were kept by they were surrendered by parents who couldn't afford to keep them. And of course, parents don't want to give up their babies generally, and so they would leave these babies in the hospital with these remarkable tokens, these sort of buttons or engraved. Um, engraved markers or uh, embroidered details, and they would leave them, leave this baby with this thing, and hope, in the hope surely that they would come back one day, they would have enough money to come back and find their baby and take their baby to a life that they had built for them, right? I was in the Foundling Hospital, it's the display of these, these tokens is deeply powerful, it resonates powerfully for me, not only as a mother, but also as a human being. This is a terrible thing that happened in the 1700s, and um, I wrote it into my book, My Hero is an Orphan, and he is orphaned on the side of a river, and he is left with an embroidered piece of cloth that he carries with him um, that was his last gift from his mother. And um, I never thought I would tell this story, but we have children at the border right now who have been left with pictures of their parents, who are not sure that they're ever gonna see their parents again, whose parents don't know where they are, and whose mothers I mean, and fathers have sort of thought to themselves, surely they lied to them. They said, I'm, I'm coming back. Or they didn't lie to them, but they said, it's okay, you're gonna be okay. And they didn't know it was the truth, but what else do you say to your baby, right? You leave your baby with, their, with your token and you just hope you're gonna come back. The Family Hospital, this happened seven, 270 years ago. And like, we're on Twitter today seeing it. So historical, historical research comes back to us. It's an echo, and um, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying, I don't know, be mad. <laughs> read, no, read, actually, read romance novels. But actually, what you're, <laughs> but what you're saying is that actually romance has always been complicated. That I don't think that romance has become complicated in the last five years or 10 years or 20 years, but that the nature of romance is complication, right? I always say that romance writers are sadists. We take two people that we love and then torture them for 400 pages. So thank you all for joining us.